Um, welcome to this debate this morning, a debate in which I hope you're going to participate actively. The proposition we're going to be debating today is this one. A decline in US leadership will lead to weaker or stronger global governance. So before I get properly started, let me just say you can go onto that website on your handheld and vote. If you like, others are voting outside this room. Why don't you join them? And so if you can multitask, which is, by the way, a very bad idea. Psychologists tell you you do both tasks badly if you try and text and listen at the same time. But if, you, if you'd like to go on that website and vote, we'll be able to take the temperature in the room um, uh, and, and look at some results in a second. And if that doesn't work, we'll just do a show of hands. <laughs> Great. So I'm Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University. And to debate this motion today, we have four um, fantastic uh, scholars and practitioners um, to, to walk us through. What's interesting about these uh, four speakers today is every single one of them has been in that negotiating room, has been involved in global governance, and can give us a sense of what, how things feel and how, whether there is a tangible change going on and what that change looks like. But they disagree. So let's get to that. Can I just say to all of you that you're part of this debate, um, put up your hand at any time. Don't wait for me to say, would you all like some questions one minute before the end? Put your hands up as we go, particularly if you want something clarified. Great, well, I'm gonna start this debate. Well, do we have any results yet on the, on the vote? Not quite yet, so just a quick show of hands. Who thinks that a decline in US leadership will lead to weaker global governance? Quick show of hands. Great. And who thinks it will lead to stronger global governance? OK, a tiny minority. OK, so that's really interesting. Thank you. And actually, so you're being bolder um, on your iPads. <laughs> um, so 50% agree that it will lead to weaker global governance, and 55% disagree. So there's people outside this room uh, disagreeing more strongly than people in this room. I'm gonna start by moving straight to Professor Joseph Nye because 20 years ago, the world debated, is American hegemony declining? Or I should say American scholars debated this vigorously. Um, great moment of national angst. And Professor Joseph Nye, in a book which was elegant and reassuring to America, um, published Bound to Lead. So, uh, Joe, are you still bound to lead, is, well, or is U.S. hegemony declining? Well, as it so happens, there's going to be a, a son or daughter of Bound to Lead, uh, which is coming out next month, which is entitled, Is the American Century Over? In 1941, Henry Luce proclaimed the American Century, so I'm asking by 2041, what will the world look like? Most people think that China is going to replace the U.S., and this leads to the question of what's called hegemonic transition. So in, for example, in the 1930s, when the US had replaced Britain, but didn't live up to its responsibilities, the argument that some make is that led to poor global governance in the Great Depression. Some people say something like this may be happening now as China replaces the US. I think it's wrong for two reasons. First of all, I don't think China will be more powerful than the US in 2041. So we can go into that later or in detail. Mm -hmm. But even more important, there's a great myth about the past <coughs> in American hegemony. At best, when the Americans had the most power of all, right after 1945, uh, they couldn't control things. They couldn't prevent the Soviet Union getting an A-bomb. They couldn't prevent uh, the communists taking over in China. In 1956, again, when Americans <coughs> had enormous power, they couldn't prevent our allies, Britain and France and Israel invading Egypt. They couldn't have prevent the Soviet Union from invading Hungary. So there's, there's a myth of the past, which is that somehow the Americans had control. This led to good global governance. And now the Americans are losing control. And so global governance will go down. I think it's wrong on two, two counts. One is it has a myth about the past, a golden glow of the past. And second, I don't think the Americans are going to decline that much by 2041. Mm -hmm. So those are two reasons for why I think it's, the question's wrong. Great. C can I come to the Canadian Foreign Minister, John Baird, who's sitting right here? Um, 
who's, you know, you're <coughs> sitting in rooms in multilateral negotiations, whether on Libya or, or, or many different foreign policy issues. Does what Professor Nye says resonate with you, or do you think, does that room feel different? Is it still <coughs> a kind of cosy American, Canadian, you know, British and German consensus in that room, or, or do you tangibly feel that something's changed? Well, John Howard, the uh, former Australian Prime Minister, uh, said that for those who uh, want to see an America in decline, be careful what you wish for because you won't like it. Uh, you know, we want to see a strong America projecting its values and providing leadership in the world. If there is no American leadership, often there is no leadership. I just think uh, in 2015, the world has become uh, so much more complicated than it was even 25 years ago. You know, the power of the G7 uh, isn't nearly as significant now that you have uh, the BRIC. Uh, BRICS, now that uh, you, uh, you, you see uh, you know, the rise in, uh, in countries which are, are going to take more provocative actions. You, know, you even look at Russia. Uh, this is being led by one man. There's no Politburo uh, you know, making sound decisions. It's uh, one man uh, you know, trying to redraw the borders of Europe uh, you know, on his own from the Kremlin. So it's just demonstrably more complex. And I think one of the, um, one of the negative parts uh, about uh, uh, you know, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is there is an increasing amount of isolation in the United States. I think we welcome President Obama's leadership on uh, Daesh in Iraq and Syria. That's tremendously important. But for a while there, the American public and their representatives in Congress were becoming increasingly uh, isolationist, not wanting to, uh, to get involved in a, in a, in a third major conflict uh, in 10 years. So for you, US power is declining. I mean, Professor Nye's work tells us that the secret of US power has a lot to do with soft power, not just hard power. It, are both hard and soft power declining in your view? When think, you sit I in that the, room, do you see a US which is both less willing and less able to lead? I think it's, uh, I think the United States just isn't in a position to be able to provide that leadership because at the, after the Cold War, we lost uh, some very clear, uh, some very clear lines. And with, a lot, with the rise of non-state actors, it's just uh, becoming more and more complex. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what about in the European Union? Um, Minister Bozka, you're the, chief negotiator for the European Union and minister for European affairs in Turkey. So you, you're sitting in those rooms in Brussels a lot, one assumes. Um, what does that room feel like? Does it still feel like the old Europe with the United Kingdom, Germany, France calling the shots and the new entry countries supplicating or, or are things changing? I think the 21st uh, century has, has a new concept, which is non-polarization. So instead of having one country, a few countries dominating the, the scene, there are many more actors, dozens of actors and dozens of subjects, which actually conquer the, the, uh, the, the day life, day's life. Of course, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when the superpower balance was broken, uh, European Union was the potential candidate to replace Soviet Union to balance the, uh, the power of the United States. But of course, uh, even though uh, US has not lost any power, unfortunately, the replacement has not occurred. Uh, to become a superpower with the wonderful uh, ideas of Monet or uh, Schumann, you can't become a superpower. So you, you, you're still a, a, a soft power, if I may say so, while trying to act like a superpower. But you will need, of course, many more things to go, like new economic markets, uh, young population, military power, and, of course, supply of energy, secure energy sources. Military, it doesn't have. It has individual military capacities. But a EU army, which, could, which should have been uh, 60,000 soldiers uh, has not yet been uh, formed. So from that perspective, I think there should be some balances. EU still is economically one of the biggest powers, but the new uh, uh, decision-making process is too slow, and it needs uh, 28 countries to decide <coughs> in some crisis situation. When the decision comes, the situation has changed, so they have to make new decisions. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there, there are many complexities in the world. And, but can uh, I ask you, when, when, when Turkey's looking for some international leadership, are there, are there any issues on which you, know, you look to the European Union rather than the United States? Well, normally I think uh, we have to make an assessment that 
When you uh, want to draw a circle for the problems of the world, perhaps uh, previously you put the compass uh, to Paris or somewhere in Europe so that it covered the, the world uh, problematic areas. But now it has shifted more to the east. Perhaps you should put it to, to Turkey, uh, the compass, so that uh, when you draw the circle, you can cover all the problematic areas. So when you, this reality uh, makes Turkey look uh, in, 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 with a different aspect, not looking at the United States only, not looking at Europe only, but I think uh, the, the fire is in our region, and I think um, the world must perhaps look at Turkey uh, more than looking at other places, because uh, solving of the problems mm -hmm are mainly uh, in our area. Mm -hmm. And with an isolationist uh, uh, policy of the United States, <coughs> unfortunately, many problems are uh, going to be with us for many years. Mm -hmm. And their uh, leadership uh, becomes important because the, uh, the preference of leaders uh, in the United States or in Russia mm -hmm. or in Europe makes life uh, more difficult or more easy, or the solving of problems are still dependent on the, uh, the vision of the leaders or the preference of the leaders. So uh, the, uh, I think the Obama, uh, President Obama's policies to bring back the soldiers uh, to the United States and not uh, allow any soldiers go back to problematic areas is in a way uh, is uh, losing some of the strength we had and in the card game we're playing, when people know that U.S. will not be there with the military capacity except for bombing or et cetera, then uh, it, it, it really <coughs> widens the, the situation. I so think you're, you're definitely on the decline in U.S. hegemony side of this. And, I don't say declining said... power, but the mm -hmm. preference of mm -hmm. the leadership uh, has pulled out the United States from the problematic areas. Are there any good sides to that? Well, uh, the good sides is uh, it, it might give some self-confidence to other countries in the world, but I don't think there's still yet uh, enough capacities there. It starts with the UN uh, inability to solve problems, first of all. The structures of the UN is uh, the, for the winners of the Second World War, which doesn't reflect the realities of today. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, in, the, in Europe as well, there's a similar system where uh, the founders of the European Union has also made a decision-making process which is built on the, cap the uh, largeness of the country and the population. It's called qualified vote. And uh, countries like Germany, France, Spain, Italy has 29 votes, mm -hmm. and they can vote any decision with 91 votes. Mm -hmm. So actually, if you don't change the, these structures, which are irrelevant with today's realities, then we don't have the UN as a success story. Mm -hmm. NATO is uh, most, much dependent on the US. Mm -hmm. EU is uh, still a soft power. And who's going to help the crisis situations is the question. Mm -hmm. It's not the capacity of the countries, but this system, uh, which has been established for other scenarios, is not helping us with the new situations in the world. Thank you. Um, so, um, a, a weakening willingness to lead is leaving us somewhat of a vacuum there. And, and we need more participatory institutions so that people, so countries step up to govern better. Um, Kishore Mabubani, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School, and for many years, Singapore's ambassador to the United Nations. You've sat in that Security Council room. You've watched that politics play out. But in recent years, you've written very eloquently about the rise of Asia. So what does, you know, is Asia rising and what does that mean for global governance? Does it mean we can look forward to a different but stronger global governance or simply an erosion of global governance? Yeah, <clears throat> as you say, Nairi, this is a debate. So let me give a very different point of view from what's been expressed so far. I mean, that's a deep flaw in the assumption of your question, which is that stronger US leadership means stronger global governance. But as you know, is often the opposite. In some areas, the United States has strengthened global governance. In many areas, it's dramatically weakened it. It hasn't ratified the law of the sea treaty. Uh, it uh, uh, cuts the budgets of UN organizations and so on and so forth. But I think the critical question 
we need to understand first is what is the state of our global governance today so we know where we go from there. And here, the, the fundamental question is, does the world need stronger global governance or not? And as you know, I maintain very strongly, the world today needs stronger global governance more than ever because the world has shrunk. The seven billion people in the world no longer live in 193 separate boats or 193 separate countries. They live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. If you are all living in 193 cabins on the same boat, we should be strengthening the overall management of the boat, strengthening the overall institutions of global governance. Unfortunately, and this is the deep flaw in the discussion so far, it has sadly been Western policy, often led by the United States, to weaken many institutions of global governance because they were seen as constraints on Western power globally. Now, in answer to your question, what will the Asians do? The fundamental decision that the Asian countries have to make is whether or not, take China for example, when China becomes number one, and I think it's gonna become number one sooner than many people think, China's gonna decide, do I play the game like the United States and keep these institutions weak? So when it comes to picking the Secretary General of the United Nations, I don't pick the strongest possible candidate, I pick the weakest possible candidate because a strong candidate is the constraint on American power. Will China do that? Or will China <laughs> possibly take a wiser course of action and say, hey, maybe we live in a small integrated world in which China is now the number one world trading power. China has got the most to lose uh, if, if international rules break down. China has got the most to lose if the <coughs> WTO system breaks down. China has got the most to lose if international maritime routes are not kept safe by international conventions. So if they arrive at that wise decision, maybe we'll do things differently from the United States and we will work to strengthen institutions of global governance, then clearly we'll have a much better world. Okay, Kishore, you've been watching China closely for the last decade. Which way is it heading? I can tell you that there's a massive debate going on in China. I go back to China every three to four months. I meet people in the think tanks. I meet some of the former leaders. And they are going through a rather deep process of reflection of where China goes from here. Last year, I went back to Beijing twice just to discuss one question. And the one question I would like to discuss is, what are the mistakes that China has made in its foreign policy in the last two, three years, and why is the world more critical of China? The fact that they're prepared to listen to those criticisms show that they're forming their views on where they're going. But I can tell you at the end of the day, I actually maintain that the best answer to where China should go was given by Bill Clinton in a speech in 2003 in Yale, where he said, if America assumes it's going to be number one forever, then we should keep doing what we are doing. Be unilateral, it doesn't matter. But then Bill Clinton added, if we can conceive of a world where America is no longer number one, then it is, Ameri then it is in America's national interest to strengthen institutions of global governance, and he didn't finish the sentence, which will then constrain the next great power, which is China. <laughs> So it'd be wiser for the West today to change its policy, to move away from weakening institutions of global governance to strengthening them because they'll provide constraints on the emerging Asian powers. Um, but you're assuming US power is then not declining. Oh, because I don't know. how can I, a decline I, I, in US power start changing I rules? think it's a, it's a very complex question. And I, I, it's no, so in, in the GNP terms, the Chinese GNP will become larger than the United States. In fact, in PPP terms, it became larger last year already. But if you talk of comprehensive national power, yeah, I agree with Joe. If you look at it comprehensively in terms of ideas, in terms of soft power, the kind of reach that United States has is far greater than China today. Uh, Joe, now I'm going to come back to you because your starting proposition that the US is not declining in hegemony um, is countered by these panelists who say the US, it's not actually a question of power, it's a willingness. The US is becoming more isolationist. What do you think? Is it? I, I think isolation is the wrong term. There, there are cycles in American policy of assertiveness and retrenchment. Uh, 
I would say we are going through a period of retrenchment in the aftermath of Iraq. But uh, it's a mistake to see that as a withdrawal and isolation. For example, when the uh, beheadings carried out by the Islamic State or Daesh occurred, it's interesting to see the change in the public opinion polls in the United States from people who say, don't get involved, to get involved. It flipped. So uh, don't take polls too seriously. They vary. And as for this question of whether we're withdrawing American troops, there are 50,000 American troops in Japan, 28,000 in Korea, 68,000 in Europe. Where the withdrawal is occurring is in Iraq and Afghanistan. <coughs> Frankly, I think that's good. I think the idea that you can go into societies which are going through their own revolutions, their own social mobilization, and try to control them is a 19th century imperial idea. I think it was a huge American mistake to try to get involved in Iraq and to govern Iraq. I think the, if you go back to Eisenhower, which was a period of retrenchment, Eisenhower was no isolationist. He'd been supreme commander in Europe. But when the French said, would you come into Vietnam and help us at Yen Bien Phu, he said, no, those jungles will swallow up our troops by the divisions. I think what you're seeing is not a withdrawal, but a more effective selection of when it makes sense to use troops. Troops can be used for containment, for balancing power, for particular purposes. The idea that in the 21st century, an external power will reorganize another country, nation building or whatever we call it, I think is passe. I don't like the term soft power. I like the term smart power. Hillary Clinton would speak to that often. And you do see the United States still be able to, um, you know, to when it makes a decision uh, to tackle a difficult problem. You look at uh, the World Health Organization struggled with Ebola. It was only when President Obama and the Americans stepped up to the plate and got strong leadership uh, and you know, brought leadership to the table and brought France, the United Kingdom, Canada, the European Union, and others to combat that problem. I mean, we were sitting around a table at uh, the General Assembly uh, among G7 foreign ministers worried about would you see 100,000 people uh, with Ebola and even more than that dead in uh, 2015. Uh, but because of that leadership, things happened and things happened very, very quickly. Uh, we've also had to, though, you know, where the UN uh, struggles with these, uh, you know, as, uh, as our, my Turkish counterpart says, um, you know, it just resembled what the world looked like in 1945. The United States has been able to, when it comes to putting in sanctions on Russia, build a real partnership with the EU. The European Union is a powerful force for good. Uh, when it comes to tackling, uh, putting sanctions on Syria, been able to work with the Arab League, uh, which has stepped up to the plate. You look in Asia, uh, ASEAN is becoming a counterbalance uh, to China, and the Americans are obviously very active at the ARF. But this is still a world view where the, you know, that says the world needs a sheriff, the sheriff's American, and America is stepping out for a tea break at the moment, right? What about the question of as the US steps out, are other countries stepping up? Because the risk, well, not, it's not a risk, it's only a risk for US power, is that if when the US retrenches, others step up and that gap in governance gets filled. Is that what's happening, well, well, uh, Minister Bozka? I think we have, to, uh, we have to agree on several points. One is US is the only superpower for the time being, and the military might perhaps is superior to any other country in the world. But US has preferred to, uh, to isolate itself. I don't agree with Professor Nye. It does, we, it, it, we don't need US in Europe. We don't need soldiers in Europe or in Korea or in Japan. It is, it is, I think, a waste of a military power. But we need US in Iraq, perhaps, or in Syria, or in where, the, uh, where we have to fight against terrorism. Terrorism uh, is something which hits from time to time, and if it is not treated in the beginning stage with a aspirin uh, treatment, you need antibiotics, and then you need chemotherapy. So, unfortunately, the American people, it's very difficult to convince the American people that uh, losing uh, lives, soldier lives, elsewhere in the uh, than the United States is, is difficult because the, the, the Satans, Saddam Hussein, uh, uh, 
the Libya leader, Osama bin Laden, is, is away. And the American people will not give permission to the leadership to send troops abroad. But then we will face a situation where something like the 9-11 will happen again, and then U.S. will come out. Before having that kind of a situation, we need the United States with us in order to handle the problems. But Soft me, power me, is for good days. Let me put the question more sharply to you. You said Turkey's the center of this geopolitical um, crisis yeah. that we've got, and that it's Turkey that needs to lead. Will <laughs> Turkey lead? Can Turkey lead? No, no, I didn't you say that. You know, if that. the sheriff's out for tea, can Turkey be one of a, a group of volunteer sheriffs that steps no, no, up I, to the plate? I, I said uh, Turkey's... Uh, experience and, uh, and points should be listened, I mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. because we are in that world and it is the only stable, politically and economically stable country in 12 years. Mm -hmm. While in Ukraine there's a problem, Caucasus there's a problem, mm -hmm. Iraq, Iran, Syria, the Arab Spring, mm -hmm. and problem is around. Mm -hmm. So we, ac we accumulated a lot of experience. So it is very difficult to handle the, these problems by looking from Washington or from U somewhere in Europe. But we have to be the point, of the part of the problem, and a country to be listened to. That is what I said. Mm -hmm. But of course, mm -hmm. the capacity of Turkey is not enough to handle all these. Mm -hmm. But we need a superpower with us here. Mm -hmm. It's not just bombing several points. Mm -hmm. Smart power makes that possible. But smart power cannot replace the military presence, the our, our troops on the land. Mm -hmm. Without troops on the land, we can go nowhere. So I want, to come to the, I want to come to the other participants in this debate and put to you the question. The one, one thing that our panellists do seem to agree on is that you, you need stronger global governance. What they disagree on is how you might get to stronger global governance. Does it mean bringing the US back from tea break? Does it mean more participation from emerging economies? Does it mean, you know, um, watching China step into this space and lead. What do you think? What do you think a stronger global governance needs? Yes, and do, do tell us your name. Yes, Katarzyna Pisarska. I'm the director of the European Academy of Diplomacy in Warsaw, Poland. I think we all bring our biased perspective and I'll try to bring a more central European perspective mm -hmm. uh, in here. And I think one that China is not ready to take on leadership and has no experience in uh, doing so. It has traditionally thought about, you know, playing a barbarian against the barbarian. And I think that we will uh, need a lot of time to see that happening. But coming back to the main question, I think we need more of the United States than less to uh, have a strong global governance. What's happening today is in Ukraine is because uh, is a direct consequence of the fact that there is less of the United States in Europe than there is more. In situations when you see a sharp decline of power uh, of a of a superpower, you see the 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 powers that want to become future powers, of course, testing how far they can go. And Ukraine is that test. And I think the United Thank States you. has a lot to offer because Central Europe is a success story. We look for success stories. Well, look what is happening in Central Europe. And this is, uh, this is the projection so of EU put, and, and, and US power. Let me put your power. point. That's a great point. Let me put it to Jean-Marie Guerin, who's w willing to uh, make a comment. But more U you sit right at the heart of the UN. Do we need more US leadership for stronger governance or not? Or is there an alternative? I think the word leadership is, is a dangerous word. You certainly need, need a lot of U.S. engagement, and the world will be a less safe place if the U.S. withdraws. But engagement is different from leadership. Today, no country can uh, set the agenda for, for the whole world. It's a, it's a diffusion of power, and, the, and global governance will be much more effective, in my view, if it's diffused. But let's, let's remember, Professor Nye said, look, the, Uni the United States never could set the agenda for the whole world. Let's not overstate what it could do in the past. Or do you disagree with that? You think, I mean, you've well, there were there were a few pretty unipolar moments. I mean, the, the greatest one was 1945, and, and actually that was a that was an enlightened unipolar moment. It was, it's a quite extraordinary that the U.S. at the time when it was without any contest, con contest the only superpower, <coughs> monopoly on nuclear. Uh, power, um, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, creditor of the whole world, um, half of the world GDP <laughs> decided to support the creation of the United Nations. That's a great moment of U.S. enlightenment. Mm -hmm. What I would like to add to the debate 
is the role of regional organizations. Um, and it would be interesting to hear from the, uh, from the panelists what they think about it, because uh, sometimes when, when I was at the UN, I had the feeling sometimes that you download problems on regional organizations that, that are not really ready to pick up the pieces, and where the regional rivalries sometimes uh, play in a less visible way maybe than at the UN, but very strongly. And in the case of Asia, which is particularly important, where there are traditional state-to-state -state rivalries, there is no overarching regional Asian organization. There is in Southeast Asia, of course, there is ASEAN, there is the ARF. It would be interesting to see, for instance, on the, one of the big strategic issues of, of Asia, the co contest over ma maritime spaces, the South China Sea, um, would the participants see a greater role now being played by, uh, by the ARF, by ASEAN? Uh, would China be willing to uh, go that way or not? Is it a dead end? Uh, should it be done at a more global level? Mm -hmm. I think this balance between the regional and the global is something that's going to play out and need to be looked at. Thank you. So there's a sort of alternative here in the offing. Um, and nowhere, perhaps, is it clearer than in Asia. China has created five different development um, organizations. Um, it's worked with the other BRICS countries to create a new BRICS bank and a new um, contingent reserve arrangement. Um, ASEAN 2020 is a big project. You know, Kishore, this is your turf. And are you optimistic that this new regional governance, which we are seeing in other regions, we're seeing the African regional organizations work much more strongly. In right across the world, each regional development bank now lends far more than the World Bank. So we are seeing this strengthening in regions. Is that an alternative global governance? Uh, yes, indeed. And by the way, let me quickly agree with Jean-Marie. He made a very critical point. What the world needs not now is not more US leadership, but more US engagement. Engagement is very different from leadership. Engagement means you listen to what others want and you work with the others. And that will be great to uh, receive in the United States. Now, on East Asia, as you know, there is an enormous amount of misunderstanding about what's happening in East Asia. I mean, I was in Davos in January 2014. I took several bets with people here who were predicting war within China and Japan. I said, there'll be no war. I gave them 10 to 1 odds, and I won all my bets in January 2015. The question is, why was there no war? And the answer is that, to put it simply, is that a certain kind of regional ecosystem is developing in East Asia. And that's the good news. Mm -hmm. And the, the center of this ecosystem, fortunately, mm -hmm. is ASEAN. Because ASEAN is trusted by all the great powers in the region. ASEAN is trusted because it is weak and not a threat. And ASEAN is the only organization that brings together the United States, Russia, China, Japan, India, EU, everyone to talk uh, together. So that may be uh, a kind of way of uh, ensuring that even though you may not be able to fix the global go governance at the top level, you can try and improve it at the regional level. But your point about the development banks, huh? it's very important to emphasize that China's move towards something like the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank, AIIB, is a second choice. Mm -hmm. China actually wanted to work with the IMF. And as you know, the problem is that China's voting share in the IMF is less than Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Belgium combined. Now, the G20 have agreed to increase China's share in the IMF, and the United States Congress has held it up for several years. Now, if you block the door for China to participate in these larger global organizations, then it has no choice but to create alternatives. So that's another, that takes our argument a step further. It says not only are we seeing regional organizations but actually, those regional organizations might help strengthen the international organizations. Because when China, Brazil, Russia, India go to organizations like the IMF and World Bank and say, please give us more votes, that's not a good negotiating position. You need plan B. And when plan B is, if you don't, we're going to create our own organizations, they have found they get more of a response. What do you think, Joe? Is this regional world, which is a bit more competitive, there's a little bit more tension, but is it going to result in better international institutions? I, I actually think it's a good thing to have more regional organizations, including regional development banks. There's enough need for capital. There's plenty of room for the banks, both at the regional and at the, uh, but the United Bretton States Woods level. The United States opposed the AIIB, though. 
Yeah, I think that's a mistake. I don't have to defend everything the U.S. does. <laughs> but let me, but let me. between the U.S. Congress and the administration. And, they, and the, uh, yeah, the administration has supported it. But, I, but let, me, let me go back to something Kishore said where I, we agree on a lot of things, but on something I disagree with him. He has a rather romanticized view of China and ASEAN. If you take Kishore's view and you ask, is that the view in Hanoi where there was a dispute over an oil rig in waters that are claimed by Vietnam, or if you ask in Manila when Chinese, fishing, when Chinese patrol boats blocked off Philippine fishing boats from Scarborough Reef, which is within the, what the Philippines think is their exclusive economic zone, and when Yang Jixue, the Chinese foreign minister at the time, spoke to the ASEAN group in Hanoi and said, we are a big country and you are small countries, and that's just a fact. This idealized view that Kishore gives you of China the leader, it's not the way it's seen. You go to India, where I was a week ago, you go to Hanoi, you go to Manila, uh, you go to Tokyo, the view of China is quite different. Uh, they see China as a potential threat. They want to have good relations with both the U.S. and China. They don't want to be prisoners of Chinese power. And that's why American troops in Korea and in Japan are very welcome. They're so welcome that the Japanese actually pay for having American troops in Japan. But Joe, they don't want to be prisoners to Chinese power, but for a lot of countries, the rise of China has liberated them from being prisoners to U.S. power. Not in the sense that they've turned their back on the United States, but they're now in a much stronger position. If you want to give our country development assistance or, well, I or think help, I think fine, that's but right. we've got China yeah. as well. We can make a choice. I think, so that's, you're good. Going to need I to think that's good. And, and people who worry about China locking up resources of Africa or something, this is nonsense. Africans have their own views, their own independence. And if you have a rise in commodity prices, which China's growth has produced, that's good for everybody. Can I quickly agree with Joe? Though? Just oh, you'd be surprised. Keep you'd be surprised. Sure. No. You'd be surprised. Uncharacteristically <laughs> unprovocative. No, 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 no. I, you, you're, you're right. China made a mistake with the oil rig in Vietnam. China made a mistake with the naval patrols uh, of Philippines. China made a mistake with the Young Judge's statement. And the, the question is, did they learn from the mistakes? Let's hope. Ha hmm. <laughs> ha, Ambassador Bosco. I think I think we have to separate two things. Uh, one is potentials and uh, non-military uh, threats we are facing and, and the threats the world is facing. So one basket, when we're talking about potentials or some non-military threats like, uh, like the uh, nuclear proliferation or, I mean, global warming, mm -hmm. uh, increasing the welfare of people, I think absolutely it is necessary that we have regional development, regional mm -hmm. cooperation there. And they are doing fine, ASEAN, Latin American cooperation, African cooperation, whatever it is, Islamic uh, cooperation. These are really functioning well, helping to develop the, uh, the welfare of people uh, and bringing uh, countries and regions together. That's okay. But when we talk about threats, there we need deterrency. And the deterrency is established by military power. And uh, there are threats there. I mean... Uh, when you are dealing with threats, as UN is, uh, is an unsuccess story because of its structures, perhaps we have to repair the UN. But there is an important <coughs> factor, which is Russia. Mm -hmm. Russia has to be uh, correctly read. Russia is, is a country uh, which plays uh, politics and diplomacy like a, a chess game. And they play the chess game in order to make you play the Russian roulette. So one has to be very careful. Not to mix a metaphor. <laughs> exactly. So I think uh, we have fought with Russia for 300 years, and we are now having our best relations uh, ever. Mm. What we have done is, with, with opportunities, we, we took out Russia from the corner, mm -hmm. while the Western world is now uh, trying to push Russia into the corner, and they are trying to prove that they are still a country, a big country, and they are still trying to recuperate the, the lost uh, empire they have. So I think sanctions work nowhere. Sanctions have not proved uh, any results, not in Libya, not in Iraq, not in Iran, not in Syria. Mm. For Russia, sanctions will not work. 
if it was possible to lower the, down the oil prices, which is not in the sanctions list, why, why are we imposing sanctions to Russia? So part of your argument is in a crisis, you need someone to lead the response, and that's where we need a hegemon. Um, can I come back to um, Minister Baird for a moment? Because Joe Nye said to us that there is, we're seeing a period of US retrenchment. So if we look at the crisis in the Middle East, the problem, you know, that the US has retrenched somewhat, but has not lost power. But in your view, is that right? Or has the United States lost one important part of its smart power, which is support for some of its values? Because some in the region would say that since Iraq, what the United States has lost in the region is the support of all those who sort of trusted the US as an ally. I think that's a fair, the last comment is a fair point. Um, the US, um, certainly in uh, 2013, was in a period of retrenchment, particularly in the region. But if you look at <clears throat> the coalition that's been established with more than 60 countries uh, to tackle Daesh in Iraq and Syria, that's significant. Um, the, the challenge is, is that what can be done with US power to prevent some of these problems? We don't have the same trip wires, for example, that we did, uh, we might have had uh, in the past in the Cold War. Uh, I mean, uh, Russia's uh, invasion of uh, an annexation of Crimea, uh, their, uh, their you know, material and active support uh, for the rebels in eastern uh, Ukraine. Uh, they're acting with impunity. Um, the U.S., Canada have tried to work with the European Union uh, to, uh, to send a uh, you know, clear and strong message that this type of behavior is unacceptable. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, Putin, uh, Putin continues uh, uh, unthreatened. So, decline in... So, so back to the initial question, has the US lost some of its um, ability to marshal willing coalitions to get allies to do certain things, for sure. example, in the Middle East? I think the reality is the United States just doesn't have the power that it did maybe at the end of the Second World War. The world is much bigger, much more complex, the rise of China, uh, the rise of the BRICS countries. Uh, the fact that you know the, G, the G7, G8 isn't the preeminent organization that it might have been even 25 years ago. Um, the fact that uh, you know the rise of the EU is another powerful force for good. I, I think you know ASEAN has been a stabilizing force in uh, in, uh, in Asia. Now I was interested in your opening remark. You said actually yes, U.S. power is declining, and this is not good because we need leadership. But Can Canadian foreign policy has for a long time argued not without a modicum of self-interest, for the role of middle powers, right, for an alternative view of global governance in which middle powers, powers play this important role. And Canada's also tried to broker and support some of these alternative regional arrangements. Those were probably, uh, those were probably comments if by the previous uh, Canadian government. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we want to see strong American leadership. We want to see uh, the mm -hmm. values that the United mm -hmm. States represents mm -hmm. being projected mm -hmm. in the world. Is that uh, so Canada can retrench even more? Not at all. Is that? Not at all. No? Fully engaged. Oh, well, listen. I mean, we're beside we, the United <coughs> States. That's we, the you know, standing with the United States, standing with uh, our European friends and allies. Uh, the, what's going on in uh, in Iraq right now? We're standing with uh, uh, our Arab allies uh, to tackle uh, this barbaric form of international terrorism. Um, just the world is so much more complex, and uh, the United States, while big and powerful, uh, you know, uh, there's been a rise of a lot more uh, a lot more state actors and non-state actors. Nari, right. could I agree yes, with that just quickly, which is, I think the world has gotten more complex, and that means we're going to have to develop networks and institutions in a wide variety of areas to get global governance. My point is that not the, the U.S. is the only country to do this. It can't be. It has to actually work with others. But if the largest country doesn't participate, those networks don't get done. So there's a big difference between, for example, saying that we're going to be smart and not trying to reorganize Iraq from inside and organizing a coalition to deal with Daesh But as Joe, we isn't, have. That, isn't that a bit problematic? We say networks, etc. but coalitions of the willing, getting like-minded groups of states to clump together, doesn't that polarize the world even more? Doesn't that make it even more difficult both to recognize some of the positive constructive moves Russia is making in foreign policy outside of the Ukraine and to have a discussion about what to do next? 
Well, not necessarily. It, does, I mean, it depends on the issue. If you take, somebody mentioned, I think it was, it was Mr. Baird mentioned Ebola. The role of the CDC, the American Health Organization, was absolutely crucial. WHO is important. WHO tends to be sometimes a bit paralyzed. I would argue the real hero on the response to Ebola was a non-governmental organization, Médecins Sans Frontières. But quickly behind that, the US did the most to provide resources and organized coalition. So we're going to see mixed coalitions, nonprofits, private organizations, governments. But if the largest government doesn't participate, it's a lot harder for the other governments. But how can we stop this instinct, not just on the part of the United States, but also Europe and others, to form these coalitions of the willing? They get to a problem in trade negotiations. They say, oh, well, let's just a group of us that see the world in the same way. Why don't we just move ahead? <coughs> Doesn't that make it more difficult to do what global governance should do, which is bring together countries that really disagree Not and help them negotiate? Not if you have open negotiate. multilateralism. If you mm -hmm. have closed multilateralism, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. If it's open so that when others want to join, you allow it, then it, not, it may be a way to actually move forward. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me make a very important factual point about Ebola. There's a wonderful book written on the World Health Organization by a scholar based in Canada. Her name is Kelly Lee. And she documents that with great detail how the West has actually emasculated the World Health Organization by squeezing its budgets. 30 years ago, three quarters of the World, the World Health Organization budget came from regular SS contributions. 25% came from voluntary contributions. 30 years later, it's the exact opposite. 25% comes from regular assessed contribution. 75% comes from voluntary contribution. You cannot build a long-term organization to take care of global health on the basis of voluntary contributions, which keep changing year after year. Sure, and that's, but, a, that's an example of a mistake made by the West Kishore, this, in undermining a World Health Organization. On this coalitions of the willing, yeah. if I might, yeah. because you're someone that has argued hmm. at times for coalitions of the willing. But now you've got this vision of a boat, and we're all on that boat. Mm. And you can't have coalitions on that boat at war with one another, or the boat's going to sink. Mm. So what's changed your view? Well, I, I actually think, you know, the, 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 the story of my life is I spent 33 years as a diplomat and 10 years as, a, and as an academic. I realized that in the real world, fixing things is much harder. And so my answer to this is that, frankly, messy, multilateral solutions are better than unilateral solutions. Mm -hmm. And it's good to get the largest number of actors possible in a messy mm -hmm. uh, multilateral solution because each person who comes into the multilateral negotiations, and having been ambassador to the UN for the, the, over 12 years, I, 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 I saw that when countries are at the table, they make a difference. And, and the, actually, the thing that's surprising about multilateralism is that the power of an argument mm -hmm actually carries weight in multilateral discussions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'd like to come to members of the audience who are from the Middle East. Jamil, you're in my sights, others. Because uh, very sadly today, we were supposed to be joined by Prince Turkey from Saudi Arabia. As you are all aware, uh, His Majesty King Abdullah passed away yesterday. So Prince Turkey could not be with us and did ask us to think about the extraordinary <laughs> steps that King Abdullah took to try to bring negotiation and peace in his region and beyond. He's not here, but I'd really like a perspective from that region about where you think global governance is or should be heading. I was fingering Jamil unfairly because I know he has links to the region, but do you have a comment to make for us? History has bothered you in a, in a strange way, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. And uh, the way I, I used to see things is that we have to go back and look at the problem. What is the real problem? But once you do this, you get lost. <laughs> so maybe it's better to have a short-term solution and try to fix things the way Ebola was fixed, rather than go back and see why did Ebola exist. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But you have to have two groups of people thinking, people are thinking, Okay, wh where did the problem come from? And the other gr group should say, how do we fix the problem? Because it's complicated and it's getting worse. But is there an instinct in the region that we need to get the US out of retrenchment no. off tea break? No. no. So tell us about what the alternative no. is seen as. No, you need the US because they are obviously the strongest 
uh, group and they have a wide vision about the issue. But the problem is with the U.S. is that they raise a lot of controversies. And a lot of people don't like the U.S. for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. So it's mixed. I mean, the Canadians are very uh, helpful. The British are very helpful. The French, I mean, Europe. You have to look at this whole thing as a general issue. Mm -hmm. And, but you have to have different group of people thinking. You know, I, I, I always go back to this uh, film on Apollo, when Apollo was coming back, and it got hit by a meteorite, and the people on Apollo couldn't fix it. So they got some group, or a group on, on the ground to examine the situation, and they were the ones who fixed the problems, not the people who were on the, on the, on the Apollo. Mm -hmm. And here it's a bit the same thing. Mm -hmm. And there's enough of us to, uh, to help each other, mm -hmm. to. Uh, we can get this done, but it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a strong message coming out of those last two comments about strengthening global institutions, strengthening the conversation across countries. You've got a comment. Yeah. Do yep. introduce <coughs> yourself. Thank you. Anton Duplessis from the Institute for Security Studies. I fo we focus on, on African issues. Uh, Fascinating discussion. I like the comment about uh, messy multilateralism. I think that's true. You will see increasing regional engagement. You'll see coalitions of the willing. You'll see multi-stakeholders. And I think that's natural. But at the level of global norms that have developed over the past 60 years, very important ones around human rights, around sustainable development, I think what you'll see there is that the multipolarity and the complexity of geopolitics is going to affect that in potentially very <coughs> sorry, damaging ways. And that's where we're going to need global leadership at the multilateral mm -hmm. level. So I'm going to ask our panelists in a minute, I'm giving them a little warning to be fair, just for the one thing that they think is the, is the highest priority for strengthening global governance. It's going to be a sort of five words or less kind of impossible task. They're brilliant, so they're up to it. But um, the one thing of the many, obviously there are lots of things that have to happen, but what's the one that each of you would give priority to? Because it seems to me there is a consensus that we need more global governance, at least on certain things, and that we are in a period of flux and change. <coughs> Rising powers, different kinds of problems, more complexity, um, US retrenchment. So what's the one thing that they would put? And before, just to give them 30 seconds to think of how they can put a huge thought into five words. Let me take a couple more comments from the audience. So, yes. Microphone. Uh, hi, my name's Granville Byford. I'm a writer. Um, we Democrats believe that governance depends upon the consent and the participation of the governed. Hegemony does not. And I'd like to suggest that we won't develop global governance for as long as the United States, my country, behaves as a hegemon. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to make one further comment, which I suspect Joe will agree with, is hegemony is a behavior. Having power merely per permits you to behave as a hegemon. Mm -hmm. It doesn't oblige you to do so. Thank you very much. I'm going to let our panelists give us just not for the world, but from your brain. Give us a little reflection of now where you got to. John, what's the one thing that you think is most important? I think the one challenge in global governance is that people bring forward such, each, each actor brings forward such different values and has such different motivations uh, that uh, that's the big challenge. So what's the way governance. to get to the better leadership that you asked for at the beginning? I, I think it's, if I had that answer, I would uh, be trying to look at the, the Nobel Peace Prize. But. Well, strong, I think it your is, answer is, such is stronger a, U.S. engagement, isn't well, it? Well, you know, American engagement is tremendously important. But, you know, when we look at trying to tackle the, uh, the situation in Ukraine that was discussed earlier, I mean, you know, what is the motivation uh, that each actor brings to the table to try to resolve that? You know, we bring, you know, that uh, it's unacceptable for one country through brute military force to invade and annex another. Um, you know, obviously, uh, other countries take a, a very different, uh, a very different view because their values uh, and their motives. You know, what is Russia's motive with respect to uh, their blocking uh, any meaningful action in the Security Council? You know, Assad is a key ally. They have the intelligence listening post there. They have their naval base. It's their only, uh, you know, strong ally in the region. So it, it's hard mm -hmm. uh, when the world is so conflicted by people that bring different, uh, different uh, uh, things to the table. So, Kishore, your answer isn't really stronger U.S. leadership, is it? My answer, which I try to put across in my book, The Great Convergence, is that 
12% of the world's population lives in the West. 88% of the world's population lives outside the West. Mm -hmm. If you want to have strong institutions of global governance, is ensure, you've got to ensure that the 88, voice of the 88% is heard loudly and clearly. Not in the present Security Council, where 12% of the population has 60% of the vetoes in UN Security Council. Not in the IMF, where 12% of the world's population has 51% of the vote in IMF. Mm -hmm. This Western domination of global institutions mm -hmm. has to give way to a greater sharing of power, and that will lead to stronger global institutions. Mm -hmm. Joe, is your, is your view that for that to happen, you need the US to be setting the rules? I think the US has to be part of it, but I've always believed that US hegemony is a myth, is what I argue in my new book. And therefore, the problem is how do you get an ability to see that we need a wide portfolio of organizations? Mm -hmm. We need the UN. Mm -hmm. The rules of the Charter of 1945 are essential, and that is why we have sanctions against Russia, mm -hmm. because breaking those rules <coughs> that you shouldn't steal your neighbor's territory by force mm -hmm. must be seen to be expensive. Mm -hmm. But the UN isn't going to solve other things. I agree with Keyshore, we should have put more resources into the WHO, but if you look at the WHO, even in the best of times, heavily bureaucratic, many UN organizations are. What we need is a mix. We need the UN, extremely important for legitimacy. We need regional organizations. We need a new set, of, we need informal agenda setting organizations, such as the Group of 20, and we need a lot more new organizations which are mixtures in which we bring the new transnational non-state actors into effective networks. Mm -hmm. In the internet area or cyber area now, we're talking about multi-stakeholderism. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna have to think about ways to do this. So mm -hmm. to my mind, the right way to go about better global governance is to get away from the image mm -hmm. of one top-down mm -hmm. US, Chinese, or any other mm -hmm. led organization and to see a portfolio of organizations, but within that, the largest states have to help organize and take the lead in getting the organization. But your inherent reasonableness lulls us all into a sense that that's a comfortable world, shifting to this. But it, there's a lot of tensions in that. It's not gonna, it let, and it's not going to persuade the people who are lopping the heads off hostages in uh, Syria right now. Um, 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 Minister Bozka. I think uh, we have four, four challenges for the uh, global governance mm -hmm. today. One is, of course, leadership, and I fully agree with the professor's uh, answer to that. We don't have to be in, uh, dependent on only one source, but having U.S. as the principal source, mm -hmm. but having some uh, important elements around the United States and increase the capacities of uh, in organizations like the UN. But also efficiency is important because if uh, to mobilize resources and uh, bring it to the benefit of people is important. Uh, coherence is important. There are many organizations who are competent in different issues, but we have to bring together uh, the, the success stories of these competent organizations. But can I point, can oh, Sorry, the and last chance, no. last uh, point is legitimacy. Mm -hmm. We have to really make sure that uh, the same terminology used for, for all the issues and all the regions. If we, we have different views uh, of the democracy implemented in one part of the world like this and on the other part of the world differently, then we go nowhere. Mm -hmm. If there is democracy, human rights, mm -hmm. uh, respect to rule of law, it should be implemented for every country. Mm -hmm. If there is a coup d'etat in a country, we have to object that. Mm -hmm. If there is a, something wrong in, in this country, mm -hmm. we have to object that also. Mm -hmm. But there should be non-polarization between religions, mm -hmm. ethnic groups, mm -hmm. and regions. So mm -hmm. if we can manage that, then most of the problem will disappear. Great. I was going to ask you, but we don't have time. The audience can think about it. You're in the middle of a crisis. In the end, do you think for Turkey and the region, the crisis that it sits in the middle of, do you want the US back or not? Well, for, it's an unfair for, yes or for, no. For fighting <laughs> against terrorism, we need the US back. Right, US back. 30 seconds. Transparency, education, people thinking along the lines. Right, can we come right back to the proposition we started with? 
And I want you to re-vote, just to see if anyone changed their mind as a result <coughs> of hearing from these four fabulous experts. So they've, they've actually agreed on certain things and not agreed on certain things. They, they've given you arguments for and against the idea that US leadership is in decline, and they've given you arguments for and against the idea that that decline could lead to stronger global governance. Where are your heads now? Would you like to vote? Let's do it by hands. You can do it on the, you know, technologically as well. But show of hands, who thinks at the end of this debate that a decline in US leadership will lead to weaker global governance? Actually, I'm going to break that into two. Sorry to the WEF. First, who thinks there is a decline in US leadership? Hands up. So it's only about half the room. OK, second vote. Will a decline in US leadership lead to weaker global governance? Those of you who don't think it's declining have to imagine that it is at this point, right? So who thinks global governance is becoming weaker because of a decline in the US? Yeah? So it's, it's sort of half the room. I, I think it's fair to say that that means that our debaters have done fantastically well because... We confused everybody. Been, no, no. <laughs> Their arguments, our, <laughs> their arguments have been eloquently 50-50, and your votes are elegantly 50-50. Can I ask you to join me in thanking um, Minister Baird from Canada, Dean Kishore Mabubani from Singapore, Joseph Nye from Harvard University, and um, um, Minister Bozke from Turkey. Can we thank them? Good. Well, I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed your comments. Nice to 